Hey everybody, welcome to Maximum Libertarian. I am Brian. So first things first, if you haven't already, please subscribe to our YouTube channel, our Rumble channel, and our Odyssey channel. And then if you want to follow us on like news and things of that nature, our Twitter handle is at we are Max Live. So if you can go do that four things, that would be great. So, all right. Here we go with today's show. Instead of me sitting here talking into the microphone, I am going to be playing an interview that I recorded last night. That was October 12th of 2022 with Mike Termott. Mike Termott is the first individual to declare... He is seeking the nomination from the Libertarian Party for president in 2024. We're getting ready to go once again into another election cycle where I see absolutely no reason for the Libertarian Party not to be able to hit the 5% nationally or If you're in the state of Virginia, I don't know all the other states, obviously, but here in the Commonwealth, you've got to hit 10% so you become a major party. If we hit that number, we we don't have to do ballot accessing, we're automatically on the ballot, all the good stuff. But since our uh, dear leaders like to make it so hard to make sure that only their voice gets heard They like to put up these roadblocks. But, once again, like I said, 2024, I think we can, once again, if we don't trip over ourselves, we should be able to hit that magic number. Mike impressed he did do and said was, instead of waiting to get the number, you're going to run for president, go on out and start you know, getting your name out there. He's been going from state to state. He's been going to Libertarian Affiliates, introducing himself. So real quick, I'll go over who Mike Termont is. You can go to his website, uh, newgolddeal.org. That's newgolddeal.org. Or you can go to miketermont.com. That's M I K E. T-E-R-M-A-A-T dot com. You can find all this information down in the description, too. So, uh, Mike, he, he ran for a special election in Florida, District 20, back in 2021. He was a former police officer for 11 years. He had a career in finance and economics, from, and he's worked with banks, the White House, Office of Management and Budget, International Development Agencies, Federal Agency, Trade Associations, and in 2020, and sorry, in 2002, he started a professional education business for bank executives, which ran until 2009, which included conferences, webcasting, and strategic counseling. So, that's a little bit about Mike. Please go visit his website. Either one, a new gold deal dot org is the one with all of his platforms, and so does and but his website will also lead you to it. But let's uh get on with it. I'll tell you right now, everyone that I spoke with at the meeting thought he did a very good job. I was impressed. Uh, other members, like I said, were very impressed with him, and I think he's the type of candidate that we need so we can stop going to these endless wars, destroying our country with the debt, having our freedoms and liberty taken, and uh, that's about it. So sit back, put your feet up, or if you're at work, keep on working. All right, if you're into radio, I guess turn it up. And sit back to listen to the soothing sounds of potential nominee for the Libertarian Party, Mike Termont. Okay, so once again, this is Mike Termont. He is, uh, he's the first person to declare his 
plan to run, seek the nomination for the L, from the LP for president in 2024. He's here today to tell us about the Gold New Deal dot org. You can see that all of his platform, and he's going to tell you. And then, if you want to ask him any questions, please go ahead. And after he gets done, I'll we'll speak fast so we can get the questions. Yeah. I notice you're a very shy group, and you don't like to talk. So I'm glad I don't have to carry the the whole day myself. <laughs> what haven't we already talked about? The the big thing that that I want to bring as a message to you all is that I believe that we have a huge opportunity in 2024. The party does. And that's for a couple of different reasons. And one might argue that we've had opportunities in the past, but I think 2024 represents a bigger opportunity than ever before. And that's for a couple of very specific uh, different reasons. One is I believe that people are increasingly in the United States, American voters are beginning to realize that a lot of our problems are linked to bad public policy. I think that's something that we as libertarians would say that we've recognized for a long, 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 long time. And many, many Americans will not wake up to that idea for a long more time. But I would argue that increasingly people are able to recognize they didn't like the COVID regime. People in increasing proportion understand that inflation is caused by the, the Fed and by federal government spending, and they're able to connect those dots. I think people are able to uh, look at our militaristic interventions around the world and realize that that is bad public policy uh, on steroids and that people are increasingly unhappy about that and people increasingly recognize that uh, ethics aside when it comes to war, which is kind of a weird thing to say, especially as a libertarian, but if we can just set the ethics aside for a moment about war, about which we would all agree, it is increasingly difficult to make the case the United States is on a strategic level even good at it. Tactically, we're very good at it. Right, We're very good at taking ground, blowing things up, and killing people. We're not particularly good at achieving strategic objectives that most Americans would look back on and say, that was a good idea, that was worth it, I'm glad we did that. And you don't have to be as old as you and I are to remember Vietnam. We've had plenty of examples even since then. So uh, the United States is not going in the right direction as far as federal public policy or even state public policy in, in, in the vast majority of cases, and I think people are increasingly connecting those dots. The other reason I think it's a huge opportunity is because people are increasingly dissatisfied with their political parties. If I can draw a distinction between public policy in general and economic problems, COVID problems, and foreign policy problems, and the parties themselves. Now we can all argue about why the parties have gone in the directions they have. A big turning point was the introduction of sort of a bifurcation in how we get our news in this country with cable news, right? Increasingly, people are able to recognize people on the other side of the aisle, metaphorically speaking, as being worth a damn. People just don't like other people in the United States anymore who have different political views than they do. That is a fairly recent phenomenon. Yes, my grandparents made fun of my mother for being a Democrat, but you know it was sort of in, in good jest 20 and 40 years ago. Now, people honestly don't want their daughter to marry someone in, in the other party, and they're very serious about it. And what that has led to is each party has adopted as its number one objective, I would argue, keeping the other party out of power as opposed to the platforms that they used to pursue. Uh, you and I remember when the Republican Party was at least allegedly fiscally conservative. At least they would pursue, at least they would claim to pursue it, right? Now they clearly don't pursue it and rarely even claim to do so. Their big shtick is keeping the Democrats out of power and it's the same thing uh, from the Democratic point of view, right? They're much more into cancel culture than they are, and, and keeping Republicans out of power and people that they don't agree with out of power, than they are in pursuing any sort of protection for your First Amendment rights or any of your other rights. This is a relatively recent phenomenon and people are sick of it. Not completely, obviously, but increasingly so. The Republican Party is obviously split with Trump. Uh, the Democratic Party is about to be split over their incumbent president, both of which are very strange phenomena. 
but no matter how strange we think it, it might be, it is unfortunately reality. Or, for the Libertarian Party, selfishly speaking, uh, not so unfortunate. It is a huge opportunity for us. Having said that, I do believe that, that we can screw this up. I think that we have proven in the past that we can screw this up. And I think that there's a couple of categories in which we're most uh, liable to, to do so, most likely to do so. Uh, one is through uh, what I would call weak messaging. And I don't mean to sound like, you know, Joe Radical, but I think it's hard to argue that our messaging was successful two years ago or six or ten years ago. I'm probably going to sound a little bit critical of our past campaigns, and I don't mean it personally. You know, the governor seemed like a, a nice guy, a smart guy. Everyone said he was a successful governor in New Mexico. Uh, I wasn't there for those years. I'll have to take uh, people's word for it. Um, it's not personal. And Joe Jorgensen, specifically, I think she's a lovely person. She's been nice to me. I try to be nice to her. Uh, she seems like a libertarian. She seems fairly smart. Uh, this isn't personal, right? And by the way, anyone say anything bad about Spike Cohen, we're going to fight in the hallway. Okay? Just I thought I should throw that out there. Having said that, uh, I think Spike would agree that messaging was not handled in a very effective manner two years ago. Obviously, we missed the boat on taking advantage of the COVID regime. That's easy to say looking back. I'm going to try to give her the benefit of the doubt and say, I'm sure they were caught like deer in the headlights. They didn't know which way this way this thing was going to go. And if it turns out to be the Andromeda strain, this is an old movie. Yeah. Ask your parents. Um, then you don't want to be the one that looks like you didn't take it seriously. I get that. Having said that, a little bit of courage would have paid off enormously. Spike told her so and was shunned. Okay. <coughs> but it's not about the specifics. It's about sort of a, a gut check and what it is that you feel needs to be done to garner attention. Go back to the governor four years earlier. Again, nothing personal, but if your message is and so I, I sometimes get this wrong, so work with me. If your message is, uh, I'm fiscally conservative like a Republican and socially liberal like a Democrat. I think I got that right. You actually don't have a message. You've just told us you have no message. You've told us you're a little bit like one party, a little bit like another party, and so I've got no reason to be here, right? Uh, I'm, I'm not gonna bring anything new, almost definitionally, Right? I've defined myself in terms of overlap with the other parties. I'm offering nothing new. Uh, if you hate the Republicans, you hate the Democrats, a little bit each, you can hate me completely, I suppose. That's another way to look at the other side of the coin. So again, nothing personal, but he gave no one a reason to back him. And I would argue that when he forgot that Aleppo was the name of a town in Syria, an honest mistake, anyone can make the mistake. In fairness, it's okay for you or I to make that mistake. It's not okay if you're running for president. But having said that, the reason it was such a big deal is because he didn't have a backing. No one rallied around him. It was just off the cliff, right? Yeah. You remember Donald Trump famously said, uh, I could probably shoot someone on Fifth Avenue and yeah. I wouldn't lose much support. I probably got the quote kind of wrong, but that's the idea, right? Okay, well, I got to say that forgetting the name of a town in Syria is not as bad as shooting someone on Fifth Avenue. Donald Trump could have forgotten that Syria existed, right? But he gave people a reason to back him. I'm not suggesting that we should be supporting Donald Trump. He's given us plenty of reasons to, to dislike him, that swamp uh, the reasons that he has given us to back him. But having said that, you get the point. There was no one to rally around Gary. So the first time he made a mistake, gone. 
the reason he was given so much attention, at least in the beginning, was because he was viewed as credible. Public policy uh, background, public service, uh, he walked the walk, he talked the talk. The fact that he had no messaging was a problem, but the media appreciated that he was a credible threat. Which brings me to the second thing that we could, second category of things that I think we could go wrong. We have to understand that America expects certain things out of a campaign. A certain level of professionalism and a certain amount of uh, uh, traditionalism, which saddens me. But having said that, I don't mean in terms of public policy, but how you conduct the campaign. There has to be a certain amount of professionalism. They expect a certain background. They expect uh, a certain commitment to public policy, which I think was a real problem for Joe to overcome. As wonderful as I may think she is, or you may think she is, in fairness, people are correct. She's an industrial psychologist and an academic trying to run for president of the United States. There's a mismatch. And the media had a hard time getting past that. And they didn't agree with her philosophy anyway, so why, why would they even work at getting past those things? And that's a big reason why I'm running, not because I think that I'm the greatest thing since sliced bread. By the way, if you haven't tried the Southwest, it's awesome, OK? So just a, a plug, try the Southwest next time. It's not because I'm so great, but I do believe that I can help push the party's nomination process in that direction more professionalism, uh, a greater uh, reverence, if not commitment, to public policy and public service. These things matter. We tend to downplay them inside of our party because we tend to be anti-government and any number of people inside the party identify as anarchists. We know what people mean by that. Outside of our party, that's a scary term. Sometimes inside the party it could be a scary term, but certainly outside the party it's a scary term. And we need to recognize that the American public expects a little bit of commitment to public service and professionalism and TV. TV ads, for example. Our campaigns in the past have raised millions of dollars. Having said that, if you're on a bus going from town to town in the year 2020, you're not actually running for president, in my view. You may think you are, but you're not. You may be doing something great and something wonderful and spreading the message and touching people and getting a lot of good things done. But the American public does not look at that and say you're running for president. They just don't. Stay at home, stay on the couch, Joe Biden did it and he won. Spend your money on television ads. I wish this weren't the world in which we live, but it is. And no amount of wishing otherwise is going to change that. If you have $300,000 in the bank, you're doing something wrong. You need to spend it now by 5 o'clock. You don't take $8 million and say, well, I've got 16 weeks, that's $500,000 a week, I'll spend it this way, and I'll pull into the station at the end with zero. There is no advantage to flaming out in eight weeks or in 16 weeks instead of flaming out in an hour. You, if you're going to lose, do it hard and fast, because that's the only chance you have to win. You need to build up momentum in the beginning and get the message out. Remember the reason that we're in the presidential campaign at all in the first place. Up until now, we have never thought that we could actually win. The reason we do it is to spread the message, most especially so that local campaigns can get better traction. I ran for Congress last year in a, the, I guess it was the fifth bluest district in the United States in Broward County. Everyone's a, a Democrat. The ideas that we're putting out there, it was the first time most people even heard these ideas. I had a newspaper editor ask me to explain school choice because he didn't get it, not because he wanted my views on it. It was a what do you mean by that conversation? Well, you mean 
private schools would have access to, like the, the state would give money to the private schools. It's like, wow, I mean, is this a high school, you know, lecture course? Or am I being interviewed to try to get the Sun Sentinel uh, endorsement? Obviously, I didn't get the Sun Sentinel endorsement, right? If our millions of dollars, as paltry as they are, compared to the kind of money that the Republicans bring in and the Democrats bring in, if our millions of dollars had been spent on television ads explaining to people that you have an alternative and here's what it looks like, right? Anti-war and sound money, the bread and butter issues. You know, we don't have to, we don't have to think too far outside of our own box here. We all know what the messages need to be. If we had done that, then our local candidates wouldn't find themselves for the first time having to explain to an editor of the Sun Sentinel how school choice would work. Like what? You get my point. Having said that, we do say sometimes dumb things, which brings me to what I view as the third way, the third category of things that we can do wrong. And in the past, I don't think we've done as much of it as I think we're starting to. And that's saying dumb things. We sometimes step on our own message. Our caucus sometimes does dumb things in this regard, right? Obviously, New Hampshire was an example. And I don't think that any party or caucus or even local party should be held to account for a few comments made by a couple of people that should have had their mouth closed. I get that. So I don't want to blow that out of proportion. But we sometimes, as a group, don't handle certain issues really well. And we have a history of being defined incorrectly, let me say. Let me use that word. The biggest example, I would argue, would be in the, uh, as recently as the 90s, and maybe even more recent than that, people viewed our party as the weed party, right? We need to draw a hard distinction between being anti-prohibition and pro-weed. Otherwise, people think that it's just self-serving. You just want cheap weed. And I do, yeah, and I do want cheap weed. Okay, I'll give you that. But having said that, that's not the reason we fight prohibition, right? You know, Ron Paul on television famously asked the crowd, you know, how many people here would try heroin if it were legalized? No one is going to raise their hand. Not only because it would be embarrassing, but because no one would. It's not, you know, people don't try drugs because they're legal. They just don't. I know this because people don't avoid drugs because they're illegal. I wish they would sometimes, right? If, if the war on drugs worked, at least we could have a conversation. <clears throat> but both reality, the practicality, and the ethics of the situation are on the same side of the, ar same side of the argument, right? Anyway, having said that, there are ways that we can step on our own message. We can't be seen as uh, pro-Second Amendment because we like to you know, shoot things and open carry and look cool and make videos of us shooting balloons in the desert. As much as I like to do those things, that can't be the reason. We can't be seen as, uh, uh, let me come up with some examples of, of our uh, inventory of dumb things we do sometimes. We can't be seen as pro-First Amendment because we have a problem with racism, right? We can't let people position us as tolerant of racism, and that's why we're pro-First Amendment. No. We're pro-First Amendment, so you can say any stupid thing you want. That's why we may be, in certain situations, tolerant of people expressing racist views right, instead of the government cracking down on them. That's not the same thing as us saying we're tolerant of, ra we appreciate, we can tolerate, we have a, a warm spot in our heart for racism. We don't. It's incompatible with the way we see the world. But your right to say such a dumb thing is completely compatible with the way we see the world. And those two things are very, very different. But if you're not careful, you see where I'm going. 
we have to be very, very careful. And sometimes uh, we're sloppy. Sometimes we're sloppy. And that's a, that's a problem. And I think we're increasingly sloppy uh, today compared to how sloppy. We were sloppy four years ago. Now we're, we just tend to get a little bit sloppier as the years go by, I think. And we need to tighten up a little bit in our professionalism. I don't mean it's an existential threat to our existence, but it could be. It could be. It only, if, if instead of forgetting the name of a Syrian town, we made some remark that positioned us incorrectly, could be a big deal, right? So anyway, there's a few categories of the ways that I think that we could do this wrong. And a big reason why I'm campaigning is to try to help us avoid those things. Whether it's, whether I'm the right nominee or someone else, I'm trying to push us in that direction. Does that make any sense at all? So I think that we need to lead with policy. And I think that we need to lead with policy that is boldly different from what the other parties offer. Yes, I'm pushing what I see as the Gold New Deal, goldnewdeal.org. If you go to goldnewdeal.com, they'll try to sell you uh, gold, which is not necessarily a bad thing. It's just a different thing. Okay. It's a 12-point plan. There's a lot of uh, libertarian bread and butter in there, but a little bit edgier and bolder than, than what we have traditionally been comfortable pushing. And I believe that that's okay for a couple reasons. One is that most of the stuff on there that's a little bit bold is stuff that I'm personally comfortable in my personal wheelhouse, which is not to say my wheelhouse includes everything, because it doesn't, right? But having been a professional economist for a couple of decades, I'm perfectly comfortable saying we can live without the Fed. That's not something I like to hear out of every mouth in the world because I don't think everyone can back that up. But I do believe that we can sunset the Fed if done carefully in its component parts, replace it with a monetary policy that makes sense, a regulatory structure that makes sense, including letting banks go without regulation if they should choose to do so. I don't think that they would. Talk about that later. This is just one little example that some of the things are a little bit edgy, but that we could back up. And in the case of End the Fed, as an example, I think people are more ready to hear a little bit of that than they would have been 10 years ago, if you know what I mean. Because of the bad inflation that we're experiencing, I think people are ready to hear a little bit of that. The first time they hear that, there's going to be a little bit of, <gasps> but that's where we got to go. And the reason I believe this so is because I think that we need to give people a reason to see us differently from the other parties. We need to cleave hard edges against the Republican Party, not look for overlap. And cleave hard edges against the Democratic Party. There is overlap, but that's not what we should be seeking out and hanging our hat on, right? If all three parties agree on something, why would you spend a lot of energy talking about that? To make yourself sound safer or more useless or less interesting, less viable, uh, more of a waste of time. The other parties don't do that. The other parties are trying to kill each other. I'm not suggesting that we go quite that route either, right? But we should be finding areas where we can differentiate ourselves. By the way, back to Gary's, I'm fiscally conservative like a Republican and socially liberal like a Democrat. I don't know why I have a hard time saying that. Not only is it bad campaigning tactics, it's not even true. It's not even true. He was lying to those poor people. We're not fiscally conservative like a Republican, who aren't even fiscally conservative at all, right. by the way. But even in the days when, when they were trying to be, would a Republican tell you that taking money away from citizens and spending it on military interventions around the world was evil? No, they wouldn't have told you that. That's for us to tell people. If we don't say it, nobody will, apparently. That needs to be said. By the way, 
given some of the directions that the, 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 the country is going, try to remember, I think we all need to remember this, that in a philosophical sense, we are the, the descendants of the people who founded this country. It's not just an opportunity. It's an obligation. We are not trying to campaign successfully because it would make us feel good. If we don't, we're letting down our fellow Americans. I know that sounds a little melodramatic, but it's the truth. We're not doing this for us. We're especially not doing it for you and me, maybe the youngsters, but we're doing it because we care about other people, other Americans. And by the way, people outside of the United States too. I feel like we need a fundamental change in our relationship with our government and a fundamental change in the relationship between state governments and the federal government. And yeah, a fundamental change in the relationship between our federal government and the rest of the world. The rest of the world has had it up to here with our military. I'm waiting for that to backlash because it already has in a lot of places around the world. I've been in well over 30 countries myself and I can tell you a lot of them don't have any problem at all voicing their distaste for the way we see and treat the rest of the world. And I'm sort of waiting for um, the backlash from the rest of the world. And I worry about that. I think that we need to exit NATO. I think that, that we need to make it much more difficult for us to go to war. I would require every military intervention to have a declaration of war and every declaration of war to be backed up by a vote of the states. If you can't get a majority of the states, and I would make it two thirds, if you can't get a majority of the states to say this is a good idea, maybe it's not. If you can't survive that vote, what are you doing? It shouldn't be the White House's job to convince us. It should be the White House's job to hold us off, right? It seems to me that if I were in the White House, I wouldn't go to war until there was picketing in the streets, demanding that we go to, not the other way around. If you're trying to sell it, that's sick. That's a little messed up if you think about it. I don't want to be on that side of the argument. Like convincing my fellow Americans that we need to, I'm trying to convince you that you need to, I'll still be here by the way. I'll be downstairs in the situation room. You, and thank you, you are gonna go do it because I think it's a good idea and now I'm gonna shove it down your throat. That's not healthy. And I think the rest of the world is increasingly seeing that. And I worry about that in the long run. Libertarians are not isolationists. And again, we need to avoid stepping on our own message and being positioned as such. We want to engage with the rest of the world. Personally, I believe the greater engagement with the rest of the world makes the rest of the world richer and the United States wealthier. And that's all self-serving and all wonderful, but it's not isolationist. There's a big difference. So these are the things that I worry about. And these are the reasons why I think it's important that we participate uh, in the campaign and to do it right. Like I say, it's not just an opportunity, it's, it's an obligation. What do you all think? Anything give you a heartburn? Yeah, I think a lot of what you have to say is need to be said for a long time, quite frankly. It, our messaging does suck. Um, and no matter how hard you try to message right, there's always going to be somebody that's trying to tear that message down. And in our, we shouldn't be beating each other up. Brian says it really well. He says we're black belts at kicking each other, libertarians at kicking each other in the ass. It's and other crazy. places. Oh, yeah. yeah, I agree with you. And, you know, that's just unacceptable uh, in our party. And the more you try to do good for people, I try to do what I was 
in XCOM and in the CD chairs. Yeah. The more I try, the more people backlash against me and my own party. Like, why is that like that? Why are we stepping on each other's feet? And it, and it angers me because a lot of what happened with this whole situation angers me because we should have saw, we should have saw coming. And the messaging was, yeah. somebody doesn't, it, our party has a problem with, if they don't like one message, they're gonna do whatever they can do to, to that message. Uh, yeah. Our biggest problem, one of our biggest problems. You know, it's really interesting because as split as the other parties get, right, they all have their infighting and backbiting and chest stabbing. In Washington, we used to say a true friend is someone who will stab you in the chest. It's a weird expression. As much as the parties have their infighting, uh, they do rally around each other for elections. Would you agree with that? And I don't think that we do that very well. Uh, one of it's not my job to run down the other candidates so I'm not going to but I will mention we have one fellow one guy who's going to be running who openly talks about not having voted for our party last time who openly endorsed a Republican last week even though there was a libertarian in the same race I got a problem with that, and I can appreciate why I can appreciate the the why behind both of those things. By the way, I mean I was frustrated with the campaign. I mean I can see why someone wouldn't have voted for our party, and I can see why someone uh, didn't like something in particular that was said by the Libertarian candidate. I, I see all the why. Shut the hell up. That's how you handle it. I'm out, right? I saw this, I didn't like it. I'm not gonna be able to endorse our candidate. I'm gonna shut up, I'm out. It's that sort of thing that drives me crazy. You're either in our party or you're not. That doesn't mean you have to go crazy and raise money for every single candidate. We have 400 local candidates running right now. It's quite a few. Yeah. yeah. They're not all in this county. I mean, all over the United States. It'd be nice if they were here. It'd be nice if four of them were here, right? <laughs> yeah. uh, so, no, you got plenty to choose from. You don't have to back them all. But why are we endorsing one of our competitors? That just makes us look dumb. The other thing that makes us look dumb, and again, I, I'm not here to run down the other candidates, I don't like the idea of nominating. As much as I personally liked Gary Johnson, he had a lot of positions that I couldn't stand, and tactically he was a disaster, but he was a nice guy. <laughs> we couldn't help but to like him. Goofy is, the day is long, but a nice guy. I didn't like the idea of nominating someone who became famous because of another party. Does that make sense? It felt like we were outsourcing, like we couldn't handle our own shit. So we had to get someone from outside the party to help us out. That's how it felt. I know that's an exaggeration. He had joined the party, blah, 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 blah. But you get my point, is that's kind of how it felt. And I fear that's how it looked to the rest of America because that's how he was introduced. Libertarian Party uh, nominee Gary Johnson, former Democratic governor of New Mexico. Republican. Republican. Right. I bet you, pardon. As though it mattered. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for that. But as though it mattered. Right. That's an issue. That's an issue. And th those are some of the things that, that worry me, right? You know, if you can overcome all those things, then terrific. But, but I do believe that we need to push in a certain identification direction. What do you all worry about? Well, the foreign policy is the big thing that made me leave the Republican Party, and that's what I joined. Because when I got out of the Navy, I started to look, because I happened from 2000 to 2006. Yeah. So then you start looking at what 
John McCain was, you know, and the, yeah, the, yeah, whole, yeah. the whole 9 11, you know, and I was one of the guys that was back. Oh, well, the Patriot Act. Who cares? When were you in? 2000 to 2006. So, Patriot Act was. And taken. thank you for your service. Oh, you're that could not have been an easy time. <laughs> well, wow. Well. I was on a sub. I had a good time, but, but, but. You had a good time on a submarine. Oh, yeah. It was a blast, but that's a whole other story. Uh, that's a much more interesting story than me. <laughs> so, <laughs> All right, we'll talk about that later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but when I got out and I saw the foreign policy and then, like, the Patriot Act, the NSA, things to that nature, that kind of bothered me that, he, that I was blindly just following what my leader said, you know. Uh, so my question, well, you're a patriot, and, yeah. and people manipulate our patriotism. Oh, absolutely, and that's, yeah. what just, that's what angers me. And then you start looking back, the Vietnam vets, and you know, so World War II, so many things have taken place because it wasn't because they we were doing foreign policy things that led to people going into power that shouldn't have made it to power. You know? Oh yeah, that absolutely. That just frustrates me. So when you say I'm going to, I want I'm going to act the war, declare war. That's great. You say you're going to get the states to do it. Are you going to give like a certain time limit? Would you say like how how long are you? Would you say? You have all the time you want. Okay. I didn't can't know. get the votes. You can't get the votes. Okay. Because you know I remember when one of the questions, and I know I keep bringing up Ken Armstrong, but in 2020, one of we the all guys, like Ken. That's okay. One of the and he was. He's very, he was very, he had this great point because this person said, you know, let's bring all the troops home. He said that we have treaties with some bases, a lot of bases, we just have agreements. Oh, yeah, it's and hard he, to close some of them. And he would immediately. It's hard to close almost all of them. Right. But he said with the treaties would be hard. It's the uh, ones that you just have the agreement. So he would tell Congress, you've got 45 days either. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Give yeah. me a treaty or they're coming out. You know how you handle it? Okay. is you have a, a list of uh, facilities inside the United States mm -hmm. and you have a list of facilities outside the United States and you go to each senator and you show them both lists here's the stuff in your state that's what I'm gonna work on closing unless you help me with this list and they become real cooperative all of a sudden you know that uh, that uh, fuel depot in Kuwait doesn't look so essential anymore right. compared to my army base in Kansas City. You get my point. Oh, absolutely. Now, how are you going to fight the military-industrial complex? Because Slowly. Of, yeah, I mean, that's a nightmare. You know, and I know Trump did... I would allow them to sell to virtually anybody, uh -huh. but not funded by the, by the U.S. government when they do it. Okay. In other words, if the Israelis want to buy, they can buy, okay. right? But it's got to be on their own dime. Mm -hmm. And I'm not anti-Israel. No, I, I got uh, you just using it as an example. Yeah. Right. Well, it's, it's an important example. Oh, yeah. <laughs> because uh, uh, we used to give them a lot of money, and we still give them a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And we transfer a lot of arms to them. And they do buy uh, quite a bit at commercial prices, but it's got to be all on their own. Right. Which is actually how it should have been. We've done almost everything uh, wrong with uh, Ukraine, but uh, th that's a whole hour conversation. But we should have handled that very, very differently from the get go. You know, starting 10 years ago, we've screwed that place up. Right. And I do believe that NATO is an example of having screwed up a lot of things. Would you get out of the UN too, you think? Yes. I think the UN is more embarrassing than NATO. I think NATO is problematic because it obliges us to do dumb things and it causes us to prevent others from doing things they see in their own interest. We told the Poles to back off because we were afraid that their actions would draw us into the Ukrainian conflict. That's just weird. Right. The Polish people decided they wanted to do something that was in their own interest. Now, we could argue that it was a dumb thing they wanted to do. You could argue that it wasn't in their interest. But this is what they decided they wanted to do. And you could argue it wasn't the Polish people, it was the Polish government. Yes. I think the people, it's the government. Same with Russia, same with... Agreed. Yeah. But we China. told them, no, don't, because we're afraid you'll pull us into the conflict. 
We should be involved in conflicts. Thank you. Stay the hell out of them. My and that's a NATO problem for the Poles, my not just for us. World War II, he was the first person to say, we don't need to be going to these damn wars. He was never a libertarian, by no means. He was a closer to a republic than anything I've ever seen. Yeah. But his viewpoint of, we don't, as a military person, we don't need to be in these countries. China's gonna, China and Russia are gonna be the ones that's gonna screw us at the end of the day. That's right. God damn, if it ain't happening, like, it's, it's literally going like, the way he said it. Yeah, my yeah, yeah. You can like, see it coming from a mile away. Yeah. My mom would always say, "Get out, stay out of conflict." So that's the one libertarian thing. My mom don't do it at all. I've been trying to get her for years. Yeah. I've swung my brother. I've swung my my mom, or my dad, to vote libertarian because they're starting to see why yeah. I do what I do. Yeah. I've been a libertarian. Two thousand eight, and then yep. car carrying since two thousand thirteen. Yep. But now being through a lot of the steps of being up to the state level chair, I can say, like, and being a candidate, I can say, I know how hard it is to get our message across. And if you don't have a good message. And if you don't have air cover from your presidential nominee. That, that's one of the best things you said. Like, no, Brian says it all. I don't say he's beating Brian because me and Brian known each other for a long time since 2013 and good friend. But good point he makes without air time of something, you're not getting the visibility for. It's not easy to get the airtime if you're a local candidate. But if the national candidates were doing it, it would be easier for us to get it because we get more donations from the public because they would know more about the Libertarian Party. Bingo. That's the biggest thing. As Bingo. a local candidate, as a, as a house of, running for the House of Delegates in the state of Virginia. Yep. If I had a presidential candidate that you know, ran ads and they knew who the Libertarian Party was. Make a I, huge I, difference. Yeah. I'm going to tell you, I changed a lot of Republicans' minds at the polls that I was working with. Yeah. People that were never voted for another party ever in their life, and I had them voting for me. Yeah. Okay. That's big. Good for you, and thank you for doing it. And and, and what I see tremendous amount of work. It is for no I, personal satisfaction whatsoever. No, a lot of stress, and I was running the state party at the same time. So you, you, you do. I pretty much drove myself to deep into the wall. But yeah, I'll do it again, and I'm going to run for. Well, that's because none of us are very smart. We don't we, learn. We just do it again. Still, we have to take a breather, but then we're right back at it. Yeah, you can say I kind of took a breather for a few months. But the, at, at the end of the day, I'm going to get back into a damn thing. I'm going to sit here, and I'm going to go back even more local and say, this is where you're screwing up. I had an idea with a – and it's, you can use this maybe nationwide on, on a candidate the idea. We have broadband towers that they put up, right? We have what? Broadband towers. Towers, yeah, yeah, yeah. So – I thought you said broadband powers, and no, I was like, that sounds so interesting. So broadband powers, they put them in different places, they <laughs> yeah. get paid rent, right? Yeah. I'm a firefighter. Right. Fire and EMS could have them on, the volunteer could have them on their property, get yeah. paid rent, yeah. then, your, then your cost of your taxpayer goes yeah. down. Yeah, 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 okay? yeah, yeah, so yeah. That's how I was trying to lower taxes. I get it. Good right? for you. And it was a very popular thing. And uh-huh. Did you get picked up by the other parties, the idea? They're trying to. And they're trying to get me more, give them more information, and I'm like, eh, not yet. Um, I want to work with whoever people are. I mean, if I have to work with a Republican to get something that I I had a good idea to, yeah, 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 I'm no, good for you. Power to it. The county I lived in, the district was run by an independent for literally 20 some years. Um, it was an independent, and he got reelected over Republicans, and Democrats every day of the week. So that was something that made me like I want to jump into this race because I think that we had a shot. Problem is, Democrat jumped in, and that screwed the pooch when it comes to when it was just a Republican versus me. I would have a much higher percentage of food. Yeah. I also school choice was a big thing. Most people don't know about school choice. I went to a rally where I was not a speaker, but it was about school choice, and I went up there because I wanted to just listen to them. Sure. And I asked to speak because, and I told them over in this district. Yeah, yeah. They allowed me to speak. Get your five minutes. I got my ten minutes. Wow. And in Palm Beach, I only got three minutes. District, I got ripped off. That district, <laughs> so that district, that district itself, they bought Rhino. Like, I didn't have enough my signs to go around. But they got Rhino signs, a Rhino rhinoceros because Republican in the Yeah, yeah, yeah. They stuck that on every one of the other guys. The guy I was going against, Republicans, signs. Good for you. Well, like when we were, uh, when we were in Vinton last year, uh, so the, the three of us were at a table, and there was a uh, like a news crew just walking around. So we sent Dean over there, yep. 
got uh, got himself on air for a few minutes. I know people in the media, so that's, that's the other thing. And it pisses me off because some of the media, I mean, even meteorologists, so they're really not, I don't consider them like the bad media people. But they're not, because a lot of them are actually independently minded people. A couple oh, I'm sure. I'm sure. Are more libertarian than I'd ever believe. Right. Uh, well, uh, Weatherman, Will Stafford, Brent, Brent Watt, both of them guys are actually very libertarian in a lot of their thought process. Um, the thing is, they can't say that on air because they're a, a part of the, unfortunately, part of the corrupt media. Um, like the Joe DeShiel guy with the LPBA, like Holly talk, but they don't want to hear anything from people that are actually know more about it and know that you can't do that. And right. Illegal, illegal it is. Right. And they, won't want to, they don't want to get you on the news. Okay. When they want to get you on the news, but they, want to, they don't have no problem doing that, you know, putting that crap on the news. So, it can be very frustrating, no? I, I tell anybody I'll, I'll run for office. Uh, running for office is very, um, I don't know how to put it, satisfying because I was helping the, spread the message for everybody here that maybe doesn't want to run for office. Or, right. It's definitely a public service, running for office. Yep. Yeah, you don't do it, uh, certainly as a libertarian, you don't do it for yourself. As a, a firefighter, I don't, I don't uh, as a volunteer fireman, I don't do it for myself. I do it for the people that I, in my community. Yeah, well, that's, uh, that's exactly right. I, I'm not a self-centered or an asshole to do that. Like, the other thing is, let us know what, for me personally, uh, let me know what you need for your campaign. And would you be, if... Say they get one of the big guns, like Hamas or whatever, to run. Would you run for vice president? No. You don't believe it. Hamas? Uh, I mean, if it was like Larry Sharp said. Larry Sharp's a different animal. Yeah, I, I think if you didn't get the nomination, if you, Larry, Sharp I would probably wash Larry's car. Okay. Because I'm just asking because I, I think you're very well spoken. I think you have great ideas. And I think you will do well, but if you have to them supporting one of them, it's very hard for a smaller candidate or somebody that's not doing yeah. well. Agreed. I think uh, that's my biggest problem. It's, it's yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. I, I totally get it. I, 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 a couple of things worth mentioning. Uh, things are going to change a lot. Uh, we have a year and a half until the nomination. Yep. Things are going to change a great deal. Uh, the name recognition deficit I have now will not be so bad in 18 months That's as true. it is now. So the, I guess my other question would be, if you didn't get the nomination, would you, and you're in a state, would you run for like governor or something? For our no. What? No. Uh, I would probably do this again. I would probably do this again. I would just for honest, look for honest answers out of people. When yeah. And regarding the other uh, candidates, uh, I do see Larry as being a, a different animal from some of the others. You know, you, you touched a hot button for me. Uh, I got a lot of respect for Larry. I, I do, do. I love Larry Hartman. I had a long uh, heart to heart with him just a couple weeks ago at the New York convention. And he really opened my eyes to, I mean, I had known him, you know, and you chit chat, and I'd done a show a couple of times. So I knew he's a nice guy, he's a smart guy. I've been following the stuff he's accomplished in New York. But um, let me just say, he's the real deal. He's the real deal. I don't know whether the American public would accept him as a credible threat to go all the way. They should. Um, again, because our party lacks a history of public service. Uh, at least he was in the service, right? And, and that matters a lot, especially if you're a libertarian, because I do believe that we need to avoid stepping on our message, if you know what I mean. For example, um, I spend a lot of time talking about criminal justice reform and changing the way that we manage police officers and ending the war on drugs. I spend a lot of time talking about that. It helps me have that conversation because I've spent the last, most of the last 12 years as a cop. Without that, it comes across too blue. Uh, a lot of cops have a hard time listening to me 
because I, I can be pretty rough on the police establishment. But I'm actually quite pro-cop. I'm just quite anti the way we manage cops. And in the long run, what most cops don't realize is in the long run, uh, if we change things, it would benefit them. It wouldn't benefit the crappy cops, but it would benefit the good ones. See, I'm pro, I'm, that's the way ethics is, you're pro cop. You just said it in your thing, for running for supervisor. I'm like, yeah, I think they should get more money. And I'm telling you why, we should get more money. And fire, fire the bad ones. And all that, right? But here's the thing. Not all cops are bad. There's ways of doing things, i.e. don't buy tanks to raise That's somebody right. for marijuana. That's right. Use them for the absolute worst case scenario. And that's how you should respect cops. That's how the libertarians should respect cops. That's right. Because if you do things by the book and aren't trying to take away their rights, you do it by the, 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 the Constitution, right. they're not really an enemy. That's right. But in my, in my view, we need to make it more like other industries. So the fireman, I, as, a, as, a, as a fireman, that's all the same. Can I pass these here. around? How, They're uh, paid for. Since your uh, background in law enforcement, qualified immunity. What's we need to end qualified have? immunity okay. and replace it with public sector liability insurance, just like other high okay. liability businesses. The most prominent example being surgeons, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. There's, it's telling someone, uh, we screwed up, but you have no redress in court. I just find that un-American. Yeah. And I recognize that at the granular level, it wouldn't change all that much in the sense that insurance companies would be on the hook instead of the city. But we need to get away from the enormous deference shown police officers in court. Because it's not just qualified immunity. Qualified immunity actually doesn't affect as many cases as you might think. But the courts give virtually carte blanche. And I think that we need to get away from that. Uh, there's always going to be some of that. I mean, I get it. You know, a cop is... Uh, an expert, a it's sworn embedded. servant, uh, his job is to tell the truth. There's lots of reasons why cops are naturally always going to get some deference in court. But we have gone way off the deep end in that regard. At the very least, we need to be like the medical profession. We don't want to cut off someone's leg by mistake and say, well, I didn't mean to, suck it up. Yeah. Right? And if you're bad at your job, you're going to get priced out of the market. That's the way it should be. The big advantage, hi, Mike. I might get the, the state convention, which that makes You look so familiar, yes! Now I remember, thank you for that. Um, the big reason why getting a, a, a third party involved, getting uh, a private sector liability insurance carrier involved, is that they wouldn't put up with the bullshit of the unions. Unions make it very difficult to achieve any kind of transparency, to find out what's going on in particular cases, even if it's a case with which you're involved. Yeah. Unions, uh, you know, preclude all kinds of disciplinary measures, and to the extent to which there is discipline, it's completely opaque. They just thwart efforts to hold police accountable and information about that. And a private sector liability insurance carrier is not going to put up with that. You know, if you don't give us the information we want, uh, you're not going to get insured. <laughs> and by the way, if your department doesn't discipline for things that we don't like, we're not going to insure anyone in your department. Right? I don't give two hoots about your, your union contract. Your union contract ain't my problem. But it's the unions that keep local politicians from being able to do the things that we think that they ought to do. In, in my town, where I worked uh, for 11 and a half years on the road, we decided who the mayor was going to be. We had a mayor that we really liked. She was pro-cop. She wouldn't give us a hard time. Uh, the FBI took her away one day. It was very discouraging. But the good news is we didn't have to do it, right? They did it. They took her away. And we made... 
a woman mayor who uh, cleaned bathrooms for a living. Okay. Mm -hmm. And she ran a business doing it, right? She had other women working for her. So she was a local. We positioned her as a local business person. And we brought her to power. And then when the FBI dropped the charges against our previous favorite, we dumped her and brought in the next one. This is not an exaggeration. We were the only political force in town, little town, right, 25, 30,000 people. We decided. We had 100 officers, and we decided what was going to go. Now, when it comes time to negotiating the next union contract, all the things you might expect a politician to say were not said, right? You know, I'm sitting there waiting for her to say, or her representative, her attorney to say, I want greater accountability and transparency. I want to be able to pay the good ones more and the bad ones less and evaluate everyone. I want to be involved in training. And I want to be able to fire someone for just because I don't like the way they comb their hair, right? I mean, surely she has a TV. She knows the way politics are going in the United States. Not a peep. We say we want a 5% raise. She says, I'll give you two. So we compromise at three and a half. And I'm waiting for, and? Nada. That's why we need to get rid of qualified immunity and get an insurance carrier involved to do the things that local politicians just can't, won't. So how does a, so as a. Can I pass this around? Sure. As an advertising, a campaign is basically an advertisement. Yes, sir. And biography is an integral part of that. How yes, sir. does an economist become a cop? By going to the police academy. But <laughs> your question, I think, is uh, probably deeper than that. Right. Um, I'd always wanted to be a cop. When I was in grad school in the 1800s, I uh, took the police entrance exam in Washington, D.C. when I was a GW and just decided it didn't pay enough. I'm not terribly proud of the way I made that decision. I mean, I wanted to raise a family yeah. and, you know, and just decided I'm going to stay in school. Fast forward 20 years, uh, you know, I'm 49 in those days and decided I wasn't getting any younger and, you know, do it now or don't do it at all. I had just wrapped up a business with a partner of mine. We merged our little company into another business and um, and uh, I was teaching uh, economics at a couple of local universities and kind of thinking it's now or never you know as difficult as it was at 49 I figured it would have been even more difficult at 55 or 60 and so I worked as a cop from age 49 to 60 uh, until uh, 11 months ago. My certification will expire here in about three weeks. And then my wife will breathe a sigh of relief because I keep teasing her. I can still get a job in the next three weeks. It's fun. Today actually happens to be my 49th birthday. So you know. Happy birthday. <laughs> you, Time to go to the police academy. I won't, I won't say. No, you so seem in good shape. <laughs> well, we'll try. The, uh, you, you noted, I, I, I don't think it was a, a harsh criticism, but you noted that Jurgensen was coming from an academic background. Yeah. And that wasn't necessarily the best of tool sets for... Well, uh, not only was yeah. it academic, but it wasn't involved in public policy. Okay. She's so, an industrial psychologist. So my question would be, how convince me that you, as an economist, are not an academia? That, uh, that you don't carry that same... Well, uh, I've worked for the White House. I've worked for other okay. public sector agencies. Uh, I spent 20, probably not, I should probably count them. I don't think it was quite 20 years in Washington, uh, but a lot of years in Washington around the congressional uh, and legislative process. I worked for, as a free market advocate in the banking industry for quite a few years before having my own business. Uh, so I've been around a couple of different blocks. Okay. And I, I would say, uh, in, including working in the banking industry for a few years, 
I would say I know a lot about how that part of the world works. It, it is as ugly as you might think. It's not attractive. Uh, but an appreciation for how that works, I think, is, is important. I think the American public expects that. The other thing I would say is that that coupled with my 11 and a half years as being a cop, I think is, is a result of my commitment to public service. I take public service very seriously. I know what it means you know, when I see fellas who have been in the service. I was not in the service, so I, I do not presume to understand all of the experiences that, that you guys had, right? But I know the feeling that is required to make that leap of faith. And it is a leap of faith, because before you, you became a Marine, you didn't know. You didn't know even what you didn't know. Now you know things you wish you could forget. Or see things. Yeah. No. Yeah. I'm painfully aware. And, you know, as a cop, not only have I seen things I wish I could forget, I've seen things I wish I didn't know. Things I wish weren't true, like the way police officers are trained. And I understand why, but we instill fear in police officers that wouldn't have otherwise been there. And it's what leads to a lot of problems. Uh, I don't like to talk about specific cases because sure. invariably you end up wrong. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. But we've all seen cases where a cop has done something uh, seemingly uh, utterly uh, violent without justification. And people. And people. And in a certain proportion of those cases, they truly are unjustified. It does happen, right? It doesn't happen as often as the public thinks, but it happens a lot more often than we wish it would. A certain proportion of those are because cops are fearful. They're trained to fear. And they're trained on the mantra of, I'm going home for dinner. Maybe someone else isn't, but I am. That my life is the most important one out there. I don't know exactly how to look a young man in the eye and say, no, it's not. That's a hard conversation to have and still recruit people. So I don't know exactly how to finesse that. Well, I feel like it's, it's basically the exact opposite of how the police want the average citizens to Bingo. The police. Bingo. There's they, a mismatch they, there. Yes, they, they want you to trust every officer but they don't. But then they want train the them to be to fearful trust. and selfish. And that's a problem. I think it's especially disappointing because people don't become police officers because they're fearful and selfish. Right? I mean, on the whole. I mean, every once in a while you run into a schmuck. But on the whole, people go into public service and most other endeavors in life on a leap of faith. I, either a great deal or at least a smidgen of, of courage and swallowing some of the things that you might you know, have second thoughts about or about which you might be fearful. And then you get into the police academy and we teach people to fear as a way of making police officers careful. And of course it's because the training is put forward by the employers who don't want you getting killed because it'll cost them money and because uh, police officers believe that it's the best way uh, to control situations, is to always be on edge. I would disagree. I was a training officer for several years. It helps to have gray hair if you're a cop. It's one thing I learned. It's a young person's sport, uh, but it helps to have gray hair. Just that we got too many cops. I grew up in a small town in North Wisconsin. We had a neighboring town, uh, Land O'Lakes. They had the same sheriff for 40 years, and I could 
16 said at the bar and have a beer with them, no problem. And you only had, it was like one deputy and a sheriff. Yeah. No but I come down here and everyone's uptight and the cops and everyone's worried about getting pulled over or getting tickets for no reason in the yard to did anything back home. Well, it, you do bring up an interesting point with the uh, tickets. There are towns uh, motivated by ticket revenue. That does happen. Not in all places, obviously, and I don't even know if it happens in most places, but in some places, that's a real thing. There's traffic cop departments that are considered you know, revenue positive and therefore uh, well-funded. I don't know if it's too many or too few. Uh, polling data suggests that people, uh, whether white or black or rich or poor, people want either the same level of policing as they have now or more, interestingly. It is not true, notwithstanding what CNN would lead you to believe, it is not true that Americans are anti-cop. They want things to be different and manage better. They don't want the accidental violence or the hair trigger violence. All the problems that we could identify. They want to be safe, but they don't want to have the aggressive cops, basically. Yeah, which, which is a good overlap for us. It's not, interestingly, a good overlap for the Democratic Party or the Republican Party. This should be in our wheelhouse. You know, Republicans uh, knee-jerk support cops. And I don't think that that's an intelligent or sufficiently nuanced way to... I'm pro-cop, but I'm very pro-reform. You know, we need to make fundamental changes. I think uh, Republicans uh, fail to recognize that and to take advantage of what could be in their wheelhouse a little bit, and Democrats especially. This defund the police movement was moronic on their part. Not only was it bad politics, but it's a silly idea. And it's not one that, that people could could embrace. If you want to see it in real life, go to Camden, New Jersey. That's what happens when you Yeah. Get and by the way, don't go to Camden, New Jersey. <laughs> yeah, I did too. I lived in Morristown, which was lovely, but we didn't go to Camden. Morristown. Yeah. I was in Southern. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice. Well, it's nice out there. So this ought to be in our wheelhouse. Police reform, it's a nice dovetail with criminal justice reform. It's a nice dovetail with uh, ending the war on drugs, right? It's a nice package for us that we can handle much better than Republicans and Democrats. For, I mean, it's a good one for me personally, being a cop, right? It's a good one for me personally, but it ought to be for any libertarian a better fit than for a Republican or a Democrat. Anything give you a heartburn? Everything sounded good. What I'm going to do is we'll go on and wrap it up. Please stay around and still keep talking, but we'll cut the video. I have to go home. Oh, <laughs> you can always hang out. I could. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so let's all uh, thank you so much, Mike. Thank you. For I really appreciate it. Here. Thanks for letting me join y'all. Yeah, absolutely. And thanks to uh, Keith and RT Delis for opening up their shop so we could speak. Yeah, we let uh, Mike speak. Here. He doesn't run this so, at a charity, uh, does he? We got to give him some money, though. Oh, well, uh, we're paying. We're paying for his food, so. It's all good. I've got you covered. So that's it. So thank y'all so much for coming out. I better make a donation and, uh, to the cause. That's it. I'm sure you. All right, everybody. That was Mike Termont. Please go to MikeTermont.com to find out more about him. Or you can go to his other website, which has his platform, which is called GoldNewDeal.org. You'll see there, he'll have all this platform. We've had little videos and discussing it. Go there, check it out. I think you'll be impressed with what he has to say. If you have a local affiliate, invite him out. He'll come out to you. He, if you can't physically get there, I know he'll Skype with you. I also want to thank RT Deli here in Roanoke, Virginia for opening the door so we can hold our little uh, meeting there this time and I want to thank all of you for making it to the end and if you haven't already please click the subscribe button hit the notification bells follow our YouTube channel our Rumble channel 
our Odyssey channel, and then go over to Twitter. Follow us there at We Are Max Lib. And I guess until next time, my friends, I'm Brian. Stay free.